Good afternoon. I'm UCLA's Chancellor, Gene Block, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to campus and to the Betsy and Rayford Johnson track for the celebration of the life of an ex the extraordinary Rayford Johnson. My very best wishes go out to the Rayford's family who are with us today. Thank you for being here. When Rayford passed last December, people around the world noted what a magnificent athlete he had been. And it's true. He was a phenomenal decathlete, a multi-sport Bruin, a gold medalist, and Team USA's flag bearer at the 1960 Olympics. Yet, while what a person does on the field can make them a champion, it's what they do off the field that makes them truly great. And as a civic leader, a humanitarian, an advocate for people with disabilities, an ambassador for UCLA, and a devoted family man, Rafer was one of the greatest ever. Beyond Rafer's extraordinary impact on all of us and all that he accomplished, he remains fixed in my memory in a special way that assures his presence will never be forgotten by me. There are few people I remember in exactly this way. Former Vice Chancellor Winston Doby is one of those people. With Winston, it's auditory. I can still hear Winston speaking as if it were yesterday. Winston is there all the time when I'm thinking about issues. With Rafer, it's visual. I see his kind and welcoming expression that accompanied every interaction I had with him. It was a projection of human warmth and that calming and reassuring sense that everything will be okay. Every time Carol and I met with him, we felt our lives were enriched, just spectacular. Rafer's life was exceptional, but it was not a fairy tale. He enjoyed triumph at the Olympics, and he endured the but he endured the tragedy of the Robert Kennedy assassination. At UCLA, he was respected enough to be elected student body president, but he still suffered the indignity of racism from some of his classmates. Through it all, Rafer demonstrated courage and humility, kindness and integrity. More than gold medals, it was those qualities of character that made him so beloved. In today's event, you'll hear how Rafer touched the lives of so many people. His impact was powerful and lasting, so much that the governor of California, Gary Newsom, and the Los Angeles City Council were recently moved to honor his life with official proclamations. The governor's proclamation, which is right in front of me, and the city's proclamation to my left. The governor's proclamation notes that Rafer was the pride of the Golden State a man who was a torchbearer for opportunity and who fought for racial and social justice no matter the arena. Our city council's proclamation commends Rafer for his exceptional achievements and dedication to increasing disability awareness, for improving the quality of life of people with dis, uh, intellectual disabilities, and for being a champion of inclusion in the city of Los Angeles. Rafer is deserving of all these acknowledgments and many more. We remember and celebrate him from the man he was, the heart he had, and the way he inspired each of us to find our own greatness. His influence will surely reverberate for many, many generations to come. Thank you, and now I'd like to welcome our athletic director, Martin Jarman, to speak. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Martin Jarman. I am the Alice and Nam Liner Director of Athletics. And as the first African American Athletic Director here at UCLA, I stand on the shoulders. I stand on the shoulders of those that have come before me. And Rafer Johnson is one of those who I stand on those shoulders for the path that he paved. 
He was a great Bruin, a great person, and he is a man of many firsts. And I wanted to share just a few of the first that he experienced. He was the first African-American to join a national fraternity at UCLA. He led UCLA to his first ever NCAA track and field championship in 1956. I see our track and field team up there. In 1960, he carried the American flag in the opening ceremonies as the first African-American captain of a U.S. Olympic team. And bringing it full circle, he became the first African-American to light the cauldron at the 1984 Summer Olympics. Unfortunately, I never got a chance to meet Rafer Johnson, but if I would have gotten a chance to meet him, I would have shaken his hand and told him thank you. Thank you for paving the way for those coming behind you because the true greatness of a person is paving the way and doing things for others you may never meet. That is Rafer Johnson, and I would not be here if it weren't for him and the things he went through to be the first in so many extraordinary things. Thank you. Dan Guerrero, UCLA class of 74. <clears throat> Chancellor Block, Martin, Johnson family, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words this afternoon. It feels so good to finally get together to celebrate the life of Rafer Johnson, to share our stories and to properly pay tribute to the life of a great Bruin, a great American, and of course, a great man. But more than 10 months after losing him, it still doesn't feel real. It feels like he should be here today, sitting in his favorite spot right there next to Betsy. I recently read and reread uh, Rome 1960 by David Mor Moranis, a New York Times bestseller. And I was reminded once again how heroic a person Rafer was. Heroic, yes, because he won the gold medal in Rome and became the greatest athlete ever. And yes, it was also because it was the opportunity for him to be a hero to so many young athletes, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. But as we know, there was much more to Rafer's heroism than just his athletic accomplishments. As I looked into the audience today, I see individuals who were Rafer's classmates, individuals who were uh, fraternity brothers with Rafer, individuals who knew him when he was a student body president. I see individuals who worked tirelessly alongside Rafer over, over the years in service to others. My good friend Bill Schumard, uh, Dustin Plunkett from uh, Special Olympics, uh, Renata Simwell from uh, LA84, they'll be speaking here in a moment. But again, uh, I see individuals also that spent an abundance of time with Rafer here at UCLA, always present with Betsy at numerous events, uh, numerous functions, and of course, ever present at athletic events where there they were rooting on their beloved Bruins. And of course, there's his family. For Rafer, it was faith first, but after that, it was family first. Betsy, Josh, Jenny, and their respected families, all gracious and humble and talented in their own right. Certain things about Rafer are well known. He obviously was a fierce competitor. We all know that. If there was ever an exemplar of sound body and sound mind, it was Rafer. But other things were reserved for only those who were fortunate enough to really get to know him, like the individuals that I just alluded to earlier. There was always something about Rafer, something about his presence that lifted him above the masses. From a personal perspective, what always struck me about Rafer was the feeling that he was one of the favorite amongst all the angels. Yeah, we hear a lot about Rafer's heroism, his exploits and his accomplishments, but we don't hear that much about his courage. He was an American, a proud American to be sure, 
But throughout his life, he was also keenly aware, as the Chancellor alluded to, the social injustice that against people of color that was ever present in our society. And I believe that his presence, his leadership, and his willingness to step out in front, as he did in the 60 Olympics, was what he was compelled to do. That he could advance the cause most effectively, as David Moranis said, by doing what he did best, which was excel at his sport and comport himself with dignity. This, as we all know, took tremendous courage. And this was the embodiment of Rafer. I often marvel at my good fortune of having been UCLA's athletic director for, the, for almost two decades. During my tenure here, I enjoyed the greatest perk that any collegiate athletic director ever had. I had access to and developed a genuine friendship with two legendary figures, Coach John Wooden and, of course, Rafer Johnson, both eerily similar in their character as well as their approach to life, true humanitarians selflessly committing their lives to the betterment of others. Clearly, one of the highlights of my career was the opportunity we as a university had to dedicate two of our most iconic venues after Nell and John Wooden and Betsy and Rafer Johnson. And I can remember like it was yesterday that I went over to the Johnson home to seek their permission and to seek their blessing to dedicate and name this track at Drake Stadium in their honor. It was just Rafer, Betsy, and I. I proceeded to show them the mock-ups of what the track would look like featuring his and Betsy's name alongside each other. And as Rafer's eyes dampened and he bowed his head in gratitude and humility, he reached for Betsy's hand and then he reached for mine. I grabbed Betsy's hand and the three of us bowed our heads and through tears, we all gave thanks. It was a poignant moment and one that I will never forget. And after he raised his head, and this of course is no surprise to any of us, he said what made this thing even more special was that Betsy, who had been by his side, his soulmate for nearly 50 years, the person that helped drive him to greatness, would be alongside him in perpetuity on the UCLA track. She was his North Star, his guiding light, and above all else, this meant the world to him. I'm so grateful that I had a chance to know Rafer, that I had a chance to love Rafer, and of course, I think we all know now that he's running with those angels. And if he wanted to, he would be way out in front. But we all know Rafer. He's probably waiting so that the rest of them could catch up so they could run together. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson, members of the Johnson family, my name is Jazz Kyung, and I'm here on behalf of the Associated Students UCLA, its board of directors, the Graduate Students Association, and the Undergraduate Students Association. I must admit, it isn't often that these student constituencies are on the same page. Chancellor Block knows that quite well. So perhaps it's the Rafer effect, a transcendental force that pulls us here today. And so I am honored to present these two resolutions that commemorate Rafer's life and his legacy. When we think about legacy, we often attach value to what one accomplishes after college. By those standards, Rafer was one of the greatest Bruins of all time. But what one accomplishes as a student also matters. And here today, I want to highlight Rafer, the student leader. 60 years ago, Rafer became the undergraduate student body president at UCLA. He also served on the board of directors that I currently serve on. And in that historic year of 1958, Rafer approved student fee funds to create a new student union building, Ackerman Union, which celebrated six decades of operation this past April. 
Now we know that the buildings in the center of campus are special. Kirkhoff, Ackerman, Wooden Center, Student Activity Center. They all share this iconic look. But they're also special because students compelled one another to invest in them. This kind of partnership has helped build this campus. To have space for Bruins, past, present, and future. You see, Rafer, the student leader, is a multi-generational call to action. Identify issues, present solutions, do the work. Give time to this place to help this place address the needs of its time. Few students understand that. And fewer students actually accomplish that. Rafer was one of those fewer students. And I've known alumni in the decades since then who've also helped build this campus. They too embodied Rafer's commitment. And some are still here doing the work today, day in, day out. I'll conclude by acknowledging that homecoming week is a bit peculiar. I imagine those horns are for homecoming. The idea that all of us have a home at our alma mater, an opportunity to visit once we've moved on to, from, to better things. And while many of us indeed came home for today, I'd like to think that part of Rafer never left. From the rubber on this track to the concrete pillars of Ackerman Union, Rafer's spirit has always been here, inspiring us all to be better, to do better, to build a better world after leaving home, and equally important, to build a better home before leaving it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dustin Plunkett, a proud Special Olympics athlete for the past 25 years. The day I met Rafer, he became my role model and mentor. I wanted to model my speaking after Rafer and be humble like Rafer was. But I want everybody here today to close your eyes and take a moment to think about the impact Rafer Johnson had on your life. What is your answer? My answer would be, I would not be here speaking today. I'll be sitting up there with Rafer right now, watching this gathering right by his side, listening to every word from these amazing speakers here today. The reason why I'm here today is because Rayford Johnson founded Special Olympics Southern California 52 years ago. And a lot of people know Special Olympics is a sports organization, but for me, it's a life-saving organization. It was because of our Healthy Athletes program and that I had a bad dental experience when I was 10 years old and I swore I'd never go to a dentist ever again in my life. And then my coach talked me into going healthy athletes where I got free screening for my teeth. And the volunteer dentist there is looking over my teeth and abruptly stops the screening, calls over my coach and goes, Dustin, you need to go get follow care right away. And it was during this follow care that I had found out that I had gum cancer growing in the upper left side of my mouth. And who would have just been one more month longer, I wouldn't be alive here sharing my story today about how much Rafer has meant to me personally. The impact Rafer had on SOSC and my life is no different. He impacted everyone from SOSC to here at UCLA, and Rafer was always at every event. No matter how small, how big, 
If Rafer said he'll be there, Rafer was there. It was amazing for me to see how I had so many fellow athletes, coaches, even fellow staff people at Special in Southern California come up and go, hey Dustin, can you introduce me to Rafer? I'm so scared to go up and meet him. But little did they know, Rafer wanted people to go up and meet him. He didn't need people to introduce people to him. Rafer loved meeting everybody. He was so caring for others. He wanted to hear everybody's story. He wanted to be there to help guide them along the way in their life. And my lasting memory of Rafer is his humbleness, his caring for others, and his great storytelling abilities. One story that I will have in my head forever that Rafer always told was he was at a special mix event and he was told right when the first one crosses the finish line, we wanted to grab the athlete and escort them to the award ceremony. As they're walking across the track, this athlete looks up in the stands and goes, look mom, look dad, I won. And the parents of this athlete begin to cry and Rafer asked this athlete to go, um, can you please go introduce me to your family? And he asked them, why are you guys crying? He goes, you don't know the story. Those are the first time we ever heard our child speak in their life. That's the power Special Mix had. And the reason why it was there was because of Rafer Johnson founding Special Mix Southern California. And I know there's one thing we all can do to carry on Rafer's legacy and impact is let's all live our daily to day lives living by his famous quote, be the best that you can be. We miss and love you, Rafer. Good afternoon. Thank you for the tremendous honor of being able to speak here. My name is Bill Schumard and I work with Dustin Plunkett at Special Olympics Southern California. Unfortunately, I've made most of a career having to follow him to the podium. <laughs> Great job, Dee. It's been an honor to know Rafer these past two decades. Betsy, I want to acknowledge you and the Johnson family the UCLA and Olympian families sitting out there today, and countless others who've considered themselves friends, fans, and colleagues of the late, great Rafer Johnson. As Dustin said, we represent the Southern California movement here in Southern California. This worldwide movement, which now serves over five million athletes around the globe, serving people with intellectual disabilities, changing their lives through the simple power of sports as nobody exhibits better than one Dustin Plunkett. What a great privilege and honor it is to have worked with Rafer in such a noble cause. Always a leader and a trendsetter, Rafer was the first non-Kennedy Shriver family member to help lead this movement back in 1969 planting the flag on the West Coast for our movement at that time. Being involved in the Special Olympics movement has also given me the distinct honor and privilege to get to know, and I know you'll agree with me on this, one of the very best human beings God put on this earth. My career has allowed me to meet and get to know a significant number of famous, important people celebrities, if you will, and some, and I underline some, of these people are actually decent human beings. I have yet to meet anyone, anyone, who compared to Rafer Johnson. His amazing humility, empathy, and self-awareness set him apart from so many of us, truly the rest of us, he lived to lead and to serve others. In fact, as I think about a message I heard last weekend, Rafer led best by serving. Jenny, I'll never forget, you told me once that it took you several years to realize 
that her dad was actually famous. After all, he was the guy folding chairs after the PTA meeting and passing out snacks at you and Josh's games. Our good friend Ross Porter, who's with us today, told me this week that attending the same church with the Johnson family, Rafer taught second grade for a number of years, and Ross, when you asked him why, he said, I just want these kids to know that an adult cares about them. That was Rafer. However, I got to bring you a little bit of bad news today. Rafer did have a distinct weakness. He had a chink in his armor. Many of you don't know about it. While he was widely known as the world's greatest athlete, he was the first to admit that he was one heck of a lousy golfer. Being one myself, I got to share in that experience with him on more than one occasion. But I remember a distinct occasion we were playing in a scramble tournament. If any of you know how that works, four people hit the ball and you play the best ball. So Rafer gathered us together before we went out there and he said, let's get one thing straight. I don't even get out of the cart unless the first two guys miss. <laughs> so we begin the round and Rafer's on the telephone on the first hole. Our host and esteemed board member Tom Stevens also with us today. Tom's also a great golfer and he hits a great drive and his friend Roger hits another great drive and I hit a mediocre drive. And we all look at the cart and we said, Rafe, you wanna play? And Rafe said, no, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the phone, go ahead. Tom, you're the host, you're the best golfer, hit Rafer's drive. Tom proceeds to hit a great drive. And we all say, great drive Rafe, great ball. This continues for nine holes. And whoever Rafer was talking to on the phone must have asked him, how are you playing today? Rafer said, I'm having the round of my life and I haven't even gotten out of the cart yet. <laughs> Betsy, thank you for including Dustin and I in this cherished event. God bless you and the Johnson family and all of us who have had the privilege of knowing one of the truly great men in the history of the United States. Thank you. All praises be to God from whom all blessings flow. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Warren. Thank you, Betsy, for allowing me to speak today in honor of Rafer. I remember the first time I saw Rafer. It was in 1960 on a black and white television set in the first televised Olympics. I was in high school. I had never heard of the decathlon. What he did to win the gold was incomprehensible to me. It made a lasting impression, especially the photo of Rafer and C.K. Yang. Now, at that point in my life, it wasn't even in my consciousness to know that I was gonna be attending UCLA, let alone have the opportunity to meet the man who had performed so brilliantly. Fast forward, I'm at UCLA on the campus. I see a man walking. And I realized it's the guy who had won the gold medal. I immediately noticed several things. First, he was taller and bigger than I thought. Second, he looked like a Greek god. No, uh, he looked like Clark Kent because I was convinced underneath that, that polo looking shirt there was a big S on his chest because he had muscles everywhere. And then I noticed the way he walked, perfect posture. He glided, smooth, confident, cool. It would be weeks later when I would meet him, and I don't recall who introduced us, but I was surprised that he knew who I was. And we shook hands. Now in his mind, I'm sure he was just giving me a regular handshake, but the reality is that it felt like he crushed the bones in my hand. It was like a vice, 
On the outside, I was trying to be cool. I just grinned and pretended like nothing happened. But on the inside, I was feeling lots of pain, the kind you remember. So thereafter, whenever I would see Rafer, he would stick out his hand to give me a shake. I would look at his face. I would look at his hands. And I would give him a high five. <laughs> Rafer was my, my hero. I idolized him. He was like a big brother. He was extraordinary. extraordinary. Extraordinary in the way he lived his life, extraordinary in the way he loved his family, and extraordinary in the way he loved God. I'm positive that Rafer would be very uncomfortable and probably self-conscious hearing me describe him this way. He always saw himself as just being like everyone else. But there was no when you were in his company, you knew he was not like everyone else. In a lot of ways, he reminded me of, of Coach Wooden. He received a lot of fame, and both were humbled by it. Now, I, I got involved in Special Olympics because of Rafer. I remember him asking me to come out to help, and I said, oh, man, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I get too emotional, you know. I, 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 I struggle with seeing young people having a hard time. And he looked at me and said, this isn't about you. God gave you a gift and you have to share it. The benefits that you will get from volunteering will be immeasurable and I promise you that what you get in return will be even greater. And he was right. I was, definitely had some tears, but they weren't tears of sadness, they were tears of joy. It was one of the best things I ever did. Now there is a, a beautiful mural painted by the very talented Kent Twitchell of Rafer and Loretta Clyborn, who is probably the most celebrated Olympian ever. Google her, please. It is my hope that the administration will seriously consider hanging the mural on a wall on the UCLA campus. I already know two great locations. I call Loretta the Rafer Johnson of Special Olympics. He knew her very well. She idolized him too. Loretta is the first person with an intellectual disability to hold three honorary doctorate degrees, all from major East Coast universities. And I'm not talking about online courses. Loretta is a remarkable person, and so was Rafer. And I just pray that we can make that mural happen. In his life, Rafer walked with some of the most influential people in America. And he had been with people who had nothing and he was always the same with both. <clears throat> My life has been deeply enriched, more than words can express, because of my relationship with, with Rafer Johnson. I miss him terribly. I'll never forget him, and I'll always cherish our friendship. Rest in peace, big brother. Good afternoon, everybody. And my name is Ann Myers Drysdale, class of 79. And I'd first like to thank Betsy and Jenny and Josh for sharing Rafer with all of us and making the sacrifice that he touched so many people. And as everybody here has spoken, he was a part of my life too and a part of my family's. I was growing up in Chicago, and I was a little girl that loved track and field. And Babe Diedrichsen Zaharias was one of my idols. But when I saw the 1960 Olympics on TV, Rafer Johnson became one of those idols. And to think that I would meet him here at UCLA was unbelievable. And I seen Wilma Rudolph and Wyoming Atias and Althea Gibson. They were unbelievable women that I really aspired to. And they were track athletes, and I loved the sport. And I was able to compete in track and field here my freshman year at UCLA, and, and that's where I met Rafer, on the track, and got me into Special Olympics, because I would do anything for that. Uh, when I was a senior here at UCLA, was fortunate enough to win the Athlete of the Year, and Rafer presented me with the award. 
He was always there and has always been there for me. He's always been about family. He's always been about faith, the Special Olympics. And to see him with his family, to see him at UCLA and all the events, and always with his word, and as Mike said, he was so much like Coach Wooden. I had spoken to Gary Cunningham, who played basketball here for Coach Wooden, as Rafer did in those early days that he was here at UCLA. And Gary Cunningham sends his best, as Jamal Wilkes and Larry Farmer and so many others, that Rafer made an impression in their lives. And uh, Larry Farmer said that when he was coaching at Golden State, that uh, there was a chance for Rose Drake, Ducky Drake's widow, to come to a game, but she had no ride. And Larry was able to get tickets, and Rafer brought her to the game. Rafer came down on the court, and Larry thought he was going to say all these you know, big things about basketball and so forth. And all he did was shake his hand and say, thank you for the tickets for Rose. And again, his humbleness. Um, and when I got here, as, as Ducky Drake, who was uh, convinced me to want to be a pentathlete, which was the best that uh, most events you could compete in as a woman here uh, in track and field. But, you know, I think one of the things that really I celebrated and was happy about, and Betsy and I had talked about this, that UCLA finally put a father and daughter into the UCLA Hall of Fame. And when Jenny went in, it was special. And Josh, you're going to get there too. <laughs> but the impact he had on all of us was tremendous. And I just wanted to read this, if I can get through this, is from Mother Teresa. Life is an opportunity. Benefit from it. Life is beauty. Admire it. Life is a dream. Realize it. Life is a change, a challenge, meet it. Life is a duty, complete it. Life is a game, play it. Life is a promise, fulfill it. Life is sorrow, overcome it. Life is a song, sing it. Life is a struggle, accept it. Life is a tragedy, confront it. Life is adventure, dare it. Life is luck, make it. Life is too precious. Do not destroy it. Life is a life. Fight for it. And as Rafer would say, be the best that I can be. Hi there. I was a swimmer in the 1976 Olympic Games. And for two terms, I served as president of USOPA, the U.S. Olympians and Paralympians Association, our a national alumni group. I was also a friend who knew Rafer and crossed paths with him on various Olympic occasions. In one particular Olympic, a special Olympic occasion, I had the chance to be wearing one of those credentials that allowed the celebrities onto the deck with the athletes. I was supposed to hug them at the finish line. And uh, my credential said John Neighbor, Olympic backstroker. And so I was milling around and I saw a crowd, beautiful tall blonde woman with a diamond tiara and a sash, said Miss USA. I went over to meet her. She shook my hand, she read my credential. She said, oh, you're, you're a backstroker. They've asked me to be a hugger. <laughs> I'm, I'm awfully glad I didn't swim the breaststroke, I'll tell you. Um, I am a little bit uncomfortable today for three reasons. As you know, you might know, I am a USC Trojan, and I'm surrounded by Westwood and loyal Bruins. I'm also uncomfortable because I'm wearing a necktie. Swimmers consider business casual a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, and so for me to wear a tie is a, is a big deal. But I could tell you, we can all remember that Rafer wore a suit many times, and man, he made those clothes look good. He was such an elegant gentleman. Whenever Rafer showed up, he lent an element of class, of, of, of culture, to every event. And the third reason is obvious. I'm very well aware that any words I might say are inadequate to appropriately celebrate the life of Rafer Johnson. Nonetheless, let me begin. Uh, my first recollection of Rafer was when I, he welcomed me onto the 1984 Olympic Organizing Committee Board of Directors. 
Um, I never thought of us as equals, but he always treated us as such. A warm handshake, a friendly smile. His voice was never loud, but he always spoke clearly and conveyed a message with words that were indicative of his personal attention of the person in front of him. He and Betsy even sent my wife and me a lovely little wedding gift on our, on our, uh, on our wedding day. The more I learned about Rafer, the more I was impressed by his character and his work ethic. He used his notoriety to help others, never to promote himself. I have no doubt that he worked as hard at being UCLA's student body president as he did at academics or athletics or his family. His well-known respect for C.K. Yang was merely a reflection of the respect with which he treated everyone. I never heard him make himself the hero of any story. He was a humble giant, not because he thought less of himself, but because he thought of himself less. Yes, he wrestled Bobby Kennedy's assassin to the ground. After all, he did appear in James Bond movies. But the speed with which Rafer apprehended the gun-toting assailant spoke to his selfless courage in times of danger. And that was equaled only by the speed with which he accepted Eunice Kennedy Shriver's invitation to start the Special Olympics movement on the West Coast. For good reason, Rafer is held in reverent awe by children and adults, athletes and volunteers, donors, and Fortune 500 corporate executives. During the 1984 Olympic opening ceremonies, I was among a few athletes to be honored to escort the Olympic flag, the five ring flag, into the stadium. Included on that were divers Sammy Lee and Patty McCormick, boxer Richie Sandoval, runners Wyoming Atias, Mac Robinson, Billy Mills, the discus champion Al Porter, the shot putter Perry O'Brien, the decathlete Bruce Jenner, and Jim Thorpe's grandson, Bill Thorpe Jr. After raising the flag, we stood at the track edge and I noticed as the Olympic torch was making its way around, Bruce Jenner was bending over, pulling down his pants. Bruce, what on earth are you doing, I said. He smiled and he said, well, you know, David Wolper was concerned because in dress rehearsal, Rafer uh, had difficulty climbing up those tall stairs. And so Wolper asked me to wear some running shorts under my parade uniform. And in case Rafer stumbles, I'm supposed to go on in and grab the torch and finish the relay. I said, hey, Bruce, if Rafer stumbles, it's every man for himself, because I'm going to carry that torch. Right then, I felt Al Order's big paw on my shoulder. Boom. John, it's not who gets the torch, it's who keeps the torch. We all stood to attention as Rafer came by, and I smiled, thinking to myself, wow, I wish I was given the honor of carrying the Olympic flame, the final leg of the torch relay. 31 years later, as he again in the, lit the cauldron in the Coliseum of the 2015 International Special Olympics, I realized that such an honor is never given, it has to be earned. According to the IOC charter, the first fundamental principle of Olympism says, Olympism seeks to create a way of life based on the joy of effort, the educational value of good example, and respect for universal, fundamental, ethical principles. The measure of a man is less about what people think whenever he's around and more about what they remember after he's gone. I'll remember a gentleman's gentleman, a dapper dresser, dapper in behavior, gentle in speech, warm of heart. Rafer left behind an adoring wife, two remarkably well-adjusted children, loving grandchildren and shoes too big for anyone to fill. All Olympians and Paralympians should be inspired by the good example Rafer left behind. I'd like to take a moment and invite any and all Olympians or Paralympians present today to stand with me if you want to raise your hand in honor of Rafer Johnson. There's a bunch out there. Stay standing, stay standing. On behalf of more than 8,000 Olympians and Paralympians who have grown up in the shadow of this great man's reputation, his character and his service, I'm proud and honored to present a note from the USOPA immediate past president, Dick Fosbury, and a US Olympic team flag presenting it to the family as a memento of our thanks of decades of service that Rafer gave to the Olympic and Special Olympic movement and how proud we are to know that Rafer was one of us.
Good afternoon, Betsy. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, Betsy, uh, Jenny, and Josh. Thank you for including me in this very um, special tribute to a great man and a great friend. My name is Renata Semrel, and I'm president and CEO of the L84 Foundation. And you know, when Rayford Johnson carried the torch up those 99 steps to light the Olympic cauldron that began the 23rd Summer Olympic Games in 1984, we could never imagine that he would be igniting a flame of hope for millions of kids across Southern California to become their best selves through sports. And it's a flame of hope that continues to burn brightly every day. Rafer was a founding board member of the Foundation's Board of Director, and it was with great honor, commitment, love, and humility that he guided the mission of the Foundation, ensuring that the surplus from those games provided access and opportunity to sports for kids, particularly who look like him. And to date, the Foundation has supported over 3.5 million kids, trained nearly 90,000 coaches, and refurbished hundreds of baseball fields, community pools, soccer fields, all across Southern California. Okay. Rafer was always true to his word, to use his God-given talents to help others. You know, that moment in 1984 and the legacy of the LA84 Foundation remains etched in the minds of millions, but it's the totality of Rafer Johnson's life of humility, loyalty, service, and achievement, that's all worth remembering. How could a poor kid from seg segregated Hillsborough, Texas have the audacity to head west and become a university student body president, an Olympic decathlon silver and gold medalist, friend and advisor to should have been president, and a fundamental figure in a wildly successful 19 civil rights, civil rights movement that doubled as a can't miss Olympic competition. So when Rafer retired from our board of directors in 2017, we struggled to find the right way to thank and honor him, not just for his contributions to the foundations and the millions of kids that, and families that we supported, but to recognize and celebrate the totality of his life and his legacy a tribute that would continue to inspire us to use our God-given talent to help others. And it was a chance conversation with Betsy one Sunday uh, afternoon that led to the creation of an exhibit at our campus in West Adams. When I learned that Refer kept everything, and not just the obvious Olympic st stuff, I mean everything, his high school report card, which by the way, he earned a B in physical education, I should say. The, post, the bill post from his high school play, pictures with presidents, letters from dignitaries, and photos of some of the most intimate moments with his Kennedy family, trophies, awards. Again, I mean everything. Betsy and I thought about telling Rafer about our plan and getting his permission, but we knew he'd say no. As we've heard, Rafer was a man that always re redirected his light to others, never on or for himself. So we did what any smart woman would do we decided to ask for forgiveness and proceeded to sneak the stuff out in small batches. And it took several months. And the gig was almost up when Karen, our curator, um, showed up at Betsy's house and was sneaking out Rafer's bronze track shoes. And he inquired, where are you taking my track shoes? You know, the day we unveiled the exhibit, uh, Rafer and his family came early. And they quietly walked through the library. They laughed at moments, shed tears at others. And I can tell that, Cap uh, that Rafer in particular was captivated, captivated by what he saw. He walked slowly, reflecting, remembering. We had a lunch before we opened the exhibit. About 250 people were there. Many of you in this audience were there. You spoke of your personal relationships with Rafer, how he touched your life, how he touched the lives of, of those around you. And I called Rafer a couple days later to check in on him. Betsy answered the phone and I was nervous. Would he be upset? Do we do the right thing? Would he ask for his track shoes back? I tried to get a read on how he was feeling, but Betsy handed the, the phone to Rafer too quick before I could ask her. So nervously I said, hey Rafer, I just want to check in to see how you're doing. And for a few minutes there was silence on the phone. A few seconds later, Rafer said with pointed clarity, he said, Renata, you know, what you and the foundation did for me with that exhibit, hmm. You helped me realize
You helped me realize I made a life. Thank you. Just think about that for a moment. You helped me realize I made a life. You heard the extraordinary contribution that this man has made to his family, to the Special Olympics of Southern California, to this world. I was at a loss for words. It was never about him. It was always about the work and other people. It's a moment that will forever exemplify to me the extraordinary human being that Rafer Johnson was. And what a true servant leader is all about. You know, we've heard that Rafer's John, Rafer Johnson's life was filled with riches beyond measure, and his wealth was built from kindness, humility, and love. He was truly a giving angel amongst all of us. And to be able to extend a little bit of light his way and to gift him his flowers while he was with us is a moment that I will cherish forever. Rafer simply, to me and to so many others, was a marvelous human being, and we will miss him. I will miss him. But we will always and forever, he will always and forever serve as a touchstone, our torchbearer for justice, and his legacy will endure in my heart and in our work at the foundation. Wow, those are all extremely hard acts to follow. Thank you everyone for your kind, sweet words about um, our dad. I just wanted to give a heartfelt thank you to UCLA, to the athletic department, especially Josh Rebolts for um, creating a moment in time to really celebrate dad and um, to celebrate him in front of people who um, we love and who he loved and who loved him as well. And for us, today's been nothing short of a gift for the celebration of dad, who he was and what he embodied, not only that, but who he was to his family and having this opportunity to celebrate him. Today, I see your faces, and I'm so very grateful that you're all here. I know he would be too. Maybe some of you today here knew dad for what he did and for what he accomplished. And knowing that is a gift. If you got to know dad for the man that he was, well, that was even a greater gift. Knowing him as my dad, to me, that is the greatest gift of all. A month after dad passed, I knew I would be having to come back to campus. To be honest, I did not feel ready. Moving forward in my life without his presence, especially being here, just didn't seem right. Fast forward to today. Ten months later, I feel a little bit more ready. Having his celebration of life here on this campus, here in the stadium, could not be more fitting. It's where he trained and where he competed. It's where some of his closest bonds and friendships were made. It's where he was coached and mentored by Ducky Drake. These are place, and there are places all around campus that remind me of him and the memories that I cherish. Over back there at Jan's Steps, my dad would bring our big wheels, Josh and I, and we would ride them as kids, <laughs> probably terrorizing the students. On Bruin Walk over there between Acosta and Drake Stadium, he let me drive the golf cart as a 12-year-old during the Special Olympic Summer Games as we went from event to event. Here on this field, he had me on his shoulders while he cheered for and encouraged the same athletes from Special Olympics as they competed. In Poly Pavilion, the Wooden Center, and again on the field, he came to every single match and competition that my brother and I had as we were student athletes here. In that corner over there by the lifting platforms, <laughs> he played with his grandchildren, Jalen, Corey, Roman, and Jonah, during my brother's early morning workouts. Being here right now in this place to celebrate dad just feels right. 
I've been asked all the time what it was like to have Rafer as our dad and what I remember most about him. And quite frankly, there's not enough time to tell you all, all the things. I've learned so many things just by watching him. He showed me the importance of service, helping others, and just being there. Dad exemplified true, authentic humility, not seeing himself as better than anyone else and wanting to make sure everyone felt special and valued. I can't tell you the, the number of times we'd be somewhere and he would just stop to talk to somebody, shake their hand, look them in the eye, make them feel like they're the most important person in the room. He had that gift. He also showed me the importance of having a community and honoring the people who helped you get where you are and who you have become. If you've ever heard him talk about his hometown of Kingsburg, California, or his coaches, teammates, fraternity brothers, and family, you know what I'm talking about. He was a man much more about actions than about words, but when he spoke, his words were powerful. They were compelling, inspiring, and oftentimes laced with a tremendous sense of humor. <laughs> what he said and what he did just flood my mind and so many wonderful memories. Here are just a few that are deeply personable, personal to me being his child. He was the best storyteller. Dustin talked about that. I loved hearing his stories, even the same stories, over and over again. Making, making my bed after my mom washed the sheets military style so I could barely get in the sheets. <laughs> Waking me up in the middle of the night to give me a kiss when he got home late from a trip. Making up random songs together about whatever we were doing at the time growing up. Watching his equally special bond with my brother Josh taking my books to my car every morning in high school before I went to school, to the car, leaving me notes around the house just saying, I love you. Boat rides on his little Boston whaler in Newport Beach and how he would rake the sand for us every morning. He would get up early and make sure there, were no, uh, there was no debris or nothing in the sand and he would lay all the towels down, getting us ready for our beach day. We took turns scaring each other and hiding when the other, the other person came home. <laughs> um, filming Christmas mornings and every other event possible in the history of my life and Josh's. And we have the closet of tapes to prove it. He showed me my value and my worth so that I would never settle in my life. How the things that Josh and I made and accomplished were what hung on our walls and sat on our shelves in our home always making me feel like I was the brightest star in the universe. Him crying as I packed up my car for the long 15 minute ride <laughs> over the hill from Sherman Oaks to come to college. <laughs> How laughing with him and making him laugh was one of my most favorite things. He was our first coach. He was the parent setting up the goalposts for soccer in the morning and taking them down at the end of the day. The parent building the booths every year for our elementary school fair and loving on my teammates as if they were his, my sisters. I remember how happy it made him to have his family around him. All he ever wanted was his family around him. He didn't want to miss a thing. We have some hilarious stories about my dad and how he did everything he possibly could to be at all of our events. Um, some I can't tell, <laughs> but one I can tell is um, having a playoff game one day and he wanted to wait till the absolute last point before he left, knowing he had a business trip coming up that he had to make a flight for. And as the last ball dropped, he waved goodbye, got in his car and headed to the airport. Um, knowing he probably wasn't going to make his flight if he went to park his car. He did the only thing he thought he could do, and that went up to departures at LAX, took out his bag, locked the door, and just left his car there. <laughs> he still made the game and his flight. Oh. Along with my own memories, um, I love reading about and hearing about how people saw and experienced him as a person. At the end of the day, what he did was simply a byproduct of who he was. So when you see me, my mom, or my brother, please tell the stories. 
please share the impact. Yes, we might get emotional, but that's okay. Just know that it feels good to remember him and to hear how he is remembered. As I've reflected over the last 10 months, I've thought a lot about time and what I want my time to be spent on. And as hard as COVID was, I know for many of us, I was so thankful for the extended time I got at home to have with my dad, especially over this last year. As a man of faith, we talked about hope. Not the hope that maybe many of us know, but a hope that steeps in God's promises and assurances not maybes or what ifs. A hope that assured me that he would be in heaven and I would see him again one day. I will always marvel at the life dad had. He truly lived four lifetimes in one. The experiences he had, the causes he championed, the barriers he broke, the medals and awards were nothing short of extraordinary. But what I will always remember and cherish the most was the person he was. He was the very best mentor, protector, provider, playmate, companion, trainer, caregiver, supporter, coach, father, and love I could ever have. How thankful I am and how blessed I have been and will continue to be to call my hero my dad. Boy, I'm looking out there to have to follow all these wonderful speakers that have shared their feelings. Um, people have been asking me, how are you doing? How are you doing? Well, I'm here. I'm doing okay. Um, thank you again. Jenny already thanked UCLA and especially Josh over there, Rebels, for all you've done um, to make this possible just to, to celebrate Rafer's life. I first met Rafer when I was 13, and Rafer was nine years older, right? So he always joked that he had to look at me sideways because he was 22 and I was 13. So we, we laughed about that, but uh, you know, he went on, lived, did whatever he did, I did, and then, you know, even though I was 13, as I, had opportunities to meet him over the years. You know, what really, he was handsome, let's, let's face that. I was attracted to him. I mean, I'm not gonna minimize that at all. Not at 13, but later. <laughs> at 13, he seemed like, oh, he's a nice man. But then later, you know, I was attracted to him. I mean, he was gorgeous, you know. But what really attracted me was his, devotion to his family. I, I could feel that even at 13. I saw it. And his love of children. Th those two qualities were important to me, and, and he had them. And I know many of you that are here today, thank you again for coming. You, you have your own personal memories that you have um, with Rafer and of Rafer. You know, why, why did I love this man? You know, it's, it's easy to say why, actually. He, he was, and other speakers have said this, he was really, truly a humble man. It was never about him. As Jenny said, there were never tro his trophies, medals, any proclamations, whatever, in our house. He kept them in various places, but not in our, in our home. It was all about Jenny and Josh and what they were doing. It, it just, that's what it was. That's who he was. <laughs> and I forget who said it, but he, you know, when Rafer said he was gonna be there, he would be there, right? Except I'm gonna tell you one time he didn't, and it had to do with Jenny and Josh. One of them, Jenny told the story of him leaving his truck, but this other story, 
he had to speak somewhere. And one of them, I don't remember if it was Josh over there or Jenny, ha had a game. And he, he wasn't going to miss it. So he called up the person and he said, I'm sorry, I won't be able to make it. I was kidnapped. <laughs> and the, the guy he was speaking to on the other uh, end of the phone said, gee, you know, I, I didn't hear about that. And he said, well, you know, we kept it quiet. <laughs> so he didn't keep his word that day. He didn't show up. You know, I also loved, he was so kind to people. And he was gentle, as big as he was and strong as he was. He was gentle and so kind. And as other people have said, he, his whole life epitomized his service to others. Uh, Special Olympics, New Directions for Youth. God, I could go on and on and name all the organizations that he gave of himself to. And I remember him saying, and he said, you know what? You never get where you are on your own. It's because you, you have abilities, okay, but you never achieve everything that you do on your own. It's because people along the way, be their family, friends, coaches, whatever, they helped you. And I think he felt that as, as one of the two families of color in Kingsburg, that when the family moved there, people supported him. They came alongside him. And he, I think he wanted to give that back to people. And I think Josh, Josh said one time, he lived his whole life to lift, lift others up. And that really epitomized Rafer. This past August would have been his 87th birthday. So I was sitting there and I was just feeling a lot of things. I was feeling sadness. You know, we can't really celebrate his birthday. So I thought, you know what? And I don't get on Facebook that often, but something led me. I put on there, in memory of Rafer, think of something that you can do in his memory that could make a difference in somebody else's life. Well, the responses blew me away. There's a woman here today who, she went and gave blood. Uh, People made donations uh, of books, of clothes, uh, taking maybe a neighbor uh, who couldn't get to a doctor's appointment or do sh shopping. And there was one, and I think she's here today, a teacher. She established a room in her school, a classroom, where students who maybe didn't have any friends or few friends, they could go there and be there and not be alone. And it just, there were many other things, but it was like, wow, you know, we can make a difference. And um, I have to share this. The other day I was over at a doctor's appointment and I was done and I don't know, I had to go somewhere. I have no idea where I was going, but I was kind of in a rush and I saw a man, elderly, probably my age, uh, <laughs> standing there with his phone and he, he was trying to figure out what was that? He was trying to figure out how to get to the doctor's office that he had to. And I don't know, I was in a rush. Like I said, I don't know where I was going, but I got to the meter to pay my parking and I said, What are you doing? Go back and help that man. And I did. You know, where I had to be was not important, but I went back and I helped this man find where he needed to go. And the reason I'm sharing that is because when I did it, I thought of Rafer. What, what you're rushing and here's somebody that needs your help? So anyway, I, I just wanted to share that. And the last few years for Rafer were difficult ones. They were. We tried to go to as many UCLA events as possible. Um, we wanted to be there to support all the coaches and the athletes. And we did that even though it was difficult. And at times, 
he, he was self-conscious, being first in a walker, then a wheelchair, and he'd lost a tremendous amount of weight. And I can't imagine what that felt like, but I knew he, he was self-conscious, and I said, Rafer, don't worry, I got your back. And anyone that knows me knows what that means. Um, you know, as his health declined, he, he was not alone. His family continued to surround him with love. And friends, some friends were able to come, but some people would call him on the phone. And even if he couldn't talk on the phone, I would say, so-and-so called, and this is what they said. And he, his eyes would light up when he would see Jenny and Josh, our children, and our grandchildren, Jalen and Corey, and uh, Roman and Jonah, and yeah. He, and he, even when things were so difficult for him, he thanked everybody. I mean, he would thank the caregivers or the nurses or whoever. I mean, through all he was going through, he still had that within him to do that. Um, and that, I, oh, and I did want to mention too another thing besides being having the children and grandchildren around. Our son-in-law Kevin prayed with him on several occasions, and that brought Rafer some peace and comfort. And I want to thank you for that, Kevin. These last couple of years with COVID and changes in our lives, you know, they've been they've touched everyone in some way. Some people more than others. But you know what? We have a lot, all of us, everyone here, we have a lot to be grateful for. I'm grateful for my family, my grandchildren, um, <laughs> friends that have supported me through this. It's, it's been hard, you know. It, let's face it, it's, it's hard. But when you have loving people around you uh, to help you, it sure makes a difference. And I get sad sometimes, of course I do. And I miss him, but I am grateful for all the memories that I have of him. Ooh, sometimes, even though I know he's gone, I still want to call out to him, Levy, I called him that, Levy, I'm home. You know, I still want to do that. And as we travel along the journey of life, some things become more difficult for us. That's, that's life. But we just keep on going, and that's exactly what Rafer did. My hope is when you think of Rafer, you will remember everything that he embodied, not just as an athlete, but as a human being. The person he was, to me, that's his legacy. I found a piece of paper that Rafer wrote these words on, very short, but I just want to share them with you. He wrote this uh, about two and a half years ago. Very simple. Put your arms around those you love and who love you. Please take care of yourselves, and thank you very much for being here. As he doesn't even recognize himself as an icon. And I think that's one of the other special qualities of Rafer. Yet with two Olympic medals, with a national championship, serving as the flag bearer, lighting the cauldron, helping to found Special Olympics of Southern California, 
and so many other honors and awards. He's done that with the utmost of humility. My brother and I were asked many times the question, who do you look up to? The only two people that came to mind would be our parents. As all of us here travel along the journey of life, you know, sometimes things are not so easy and there are changes as we get older. But you know what? We don't give up. We just keep on going. I really believe this. Every day is a new day to live and enjoy. And my hope is that you'll always remember everything that Rafer embodies both as an athlete, but more importantly, as a human being.